actually, I, I start uh, the ambassador, the all Norwegian friends, they are scientists and uh, uh, research administrative people. Uh, I must say, uh, Norwegian uh, uh, research and scientists play a very important role in my life. Thinking back, just preparing the presentation, I realized that la last 10 years they had uh, occupied my life constantly, so, and very friendly and, and very productive way. And also today I'm going to at least show one example of this cooperation. And also I thank Research Council to picking up such an important topic. So um, I'm acting scientist, so I, I work in the field of social sciences already um, 25 years. My first degree comes from natural sciences. So I, I moved more consciously to social sciences during my PhD. And also I, um, uh, in my life I have held the position of being uh, uh, head of the um, science department in Tartu University, <coughs> which meant that uh, I, I had very um, close cooperation with many scientists from very, very many different fields. So I, I truly believe that um, the ethical principles, they are, they are not that different in different sciences. So, but I think today my role is, first of all, um, I, as I'm first speaker, so I, I just start with some general principles and um, uh, then I'm going to say something about teaching and learning and, uh, and then tell you at least two stories from my own life uh, and how they are related to ethical issues. So uh, I, I truly believe that the rules of ethics are good in everywhere. Uh, actually, I, I'm a science person. I also believe that the rules of science are uh, good to follow in everyday life. This is what I teach to students. Uh, so, but um, if we think about good scientists and good person or ethical scientists and ethical persons, are they are exactly the same? Probably it's not that easy story. There is something else in, in science. For example, asking from you, that, uh, how m many of you uh, consider yourself like scientists? Is you can raise a hand. Okay, not that many actually. <laughs> uh, how many of you are ethical <coughs> scientists? Okay. <laughs> uh, how many of you are ethical persons? <laughs> Okay, not that many actually. <laughs> okay, so it's I think it's absolutely justified day here, so we must speak about ethics. So, but what is ethical at all, and, and how to follow the rules? Or what are the rules of ethics? So it's um, I think there are some some uh, simple and and um, rules, uh, but um, and some principles which are not uh, perhaps they are universal, but they're. It's, uh, it depends on case which which principle is exactly to follow. So that the, usually, if we look at the um, philosophical uh, uh, field of, of uh, ethics of science ethics, so usually it's uh, it's still something like uh, like principles of um, ethical behavior, evaluation of ethics, like utility. It's basically, it's. Uh, uh, something like that we are, if we are conducting research and ha we have to um, evaluate whether uh, the thing we're doing is ethical, so we must calculate the, the costs and benefits and, and uh, if the, the benefits are higher than costs, so we might think that this is ethical thing. So there might be approach from right side, so it's pretty much legal, so saying that everything what we consider um, normatively uh, right thing, we have laws about what, what is right and wrong, and we are going to follow those laws, uh, and we, we don't contradict them, so we can argue that we are doing ethical things. So it's pretty much based on what is in current society <coughs> accepted and what is not it, it's something like justice, but what is very controversial definition, even uh, my background is in, in social politics and, and uh, population science, and uh, what, what, what is just and what is not just, it's, it sometimes depends. But I, I'm, I'm just showing that, uh, actually I think that all those principles are actually followed in, in doing decisions about uh, ethics. 
uh, in our science as well. But it's, it's not easy story sometimes. So it's sometimes argued that the common good is something that we should think about uh, deciding uh, about our actions or virtue. So it, whether it's, uh, for example, good enough uh, thing or qualitative thing. And that once again, I argue that actually all those principles are followed in nowadays um, ethical procedures in one or other way. Uh, yes, and sometimes it's quite complicated, sometimes not that complicated. Uh, usually I try to keep uh, things simple. So I, I, for students I say something that uh, the ethical rules are like universal rules or the basic of them at least. Uh, and they're quite simple. Uh, just to simplify it at first things. There is something like don't hurt. The best is don't hurt at all. But uh, we know it's it's as, as a science and it's it's there's some somewhere compromises. Otherwise, there wouldn't be reason to to have this uh, conference or, or seminar today at all if everything would be that easy. So there is some sometimes doing science something that uh, uh, it costs. It costs not only money, it costs something else, whether it's, it's time or, or some, some small or some suffering parts of that. For example, my, my, my children take part in one, one quite good survey in Estonia. Um, I, like a parent, must give a blood time by time. So uh, obviously I don't uh, like this procedure, taking blood. But in the sake of science, and I believe that it's it's good survey, and it's uh, they they take out of my painful blood 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 giving procedure something good. So I, I agree with that. <coughs> so they hurt me, but perhaps they have some justified need. Sometimes we know that the, the procedures we follow, um, <coughs> we know for sure that they are at least some little bit painful. Uh, but then the, the one universal principle says that uh, we should um, yeah, follow the, our um, um, <coughs> subjects or objects of research very carefully and we should heal that wound uh, as well as uh, good as possible we can. And of course, uh, don't steal, or to be honest, don't steal, I think it very much uh, it's relevant to our uh, uh, relationships with our colleagues, uh, and not only close colleagues, but the international colleagues uh, all around the world. Um, and this is much about uh, citating and, and giving um, um, deserved honor to, to work of other people. But this part I would like to, to um, put aside in, in present. The presentation and just I would perhaps speak more about relate, uh, like socials and, and uh, uh, subject uh, relationship and of course be honest everywhere I think that's a good rule always so um, is there anything so particular in, in social sciences and humanities um, because of my background uh, I, I first would argue that the, the, the great um, um, rules or main principles are the same everywhere. It, it just might be that in social sciences <coughs> and humanities it's very often argued that this is the area we, we come across most frequently with, with other people and, and, and uh, having some contact <coughs> creates lots of ethical uh, questions we, we might think about. We always, whenever what scientists argue or semantics argue that when we have any any communication, we will always um, influence somebody already. So you, we might think about. So it's also argued that uh, our research about uh, ethics in social sciences um, argues that uh, in social sciences and humanities, uh, because it's carried out in different cultures, in different uh, institutional frameworks. <coughs> it also means legal frameworks. There are different laws in different countries, different norms in different countries, uh, different beliefs, what is bad or what is good, what you can do, you can't do. So it's, uh, there is high, higher subjectivity in, in understanding what is ethical. So you might, might think that in chemistry and physics, 
so they, they, they work less with, with uh, people outside on the streets and they just care about the scientific uh, norms and understandings. But in, in social sciences and in humanities, we, we very often we can't just exist like scientists in our um, close group. We, 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 we have, do have contacts and we must take it somehow into account that, the, that societies are different. So it's, there is cultural differences. And, and of course there are different counterparts. I think it's merely, if we are scientists, we think about, once again, about research object, but of course there are research teams and scientists themselves. And, and, in, um, and that's, once again, it's, it, it applies for all sciences. I don't think it's really relevant for social sciences. But of course we must think about those also scientific teams, the safety and uh, um, the functioning. Okay, so I come to the most common and, and the principles in social sciences, perhaps, which are most uh, uh, frequently followed. Um, and just also gives some hints that uh, although they seem very u universal and simple, uh, there are lots of question marks uh, even today around them. Of course, it's in, in most cases, um, it's, it's um, uh, voluntary participation is required. And I think it's the right, right thing. Uh, but uh, coming to the work of <coughs> ethical committees or councils, we, we can't argue always that all projects should, uh, um, uh, we, we must requ require for them um, some uh, imp um, improvement or, or voluntary participation <coughs> because there are lots of methods where actually the, the research itself it's, a, it's, it's non contact research. It applies for most of the um, cases of, of observations. That means that the uh, method requires that the, 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 the people, for example, who we study, we observe, they are not absolutely aware what is, um, uh, what, what is happening. And just I give you one example, it's just recently had became one of my favorite examples. As you see, it's, um, uh, it comes from the United States, but uh, what they do, they actually uh, want to um, know um, a conformity of gender roles. So basically, that's the phenomenon that uh, how people accept different gender roles. And, and we all know that uh, probably there is no uh, huge uh, gender differences or marginalization in the United States. What they did, they put to the university uh, outdoor the labels that this is only door for uh, women and this is door only for men and this is now this non-contact research that means that uh, actually these people uh, they don't know nobody asks them uh, do they agree to participate and you, you, you might guess why it is that. <coughs> because um, we could have the other option to, for example, to apply a questionnaire to ask from those people uh, to, what would you say that? Would you, do, you act, do you think it's the right thing that you, you will for, um, enter only university from the women's door? Everybody would say it's nonsense, absolutely nonsense. But if you do experiments or observations like that, what is very common in, in um, social sciences, in psychology ex especially, so we, we de actually see that uh, in real life, uh, people behave in a way we cannot expect. And the, the aim of science is, is to know that the truth, what, what is actually happens. Okay, so we... Um, so what I wanted to show you was that the, 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 there is some uh, exceptions and, uh, and uh, it's, it's really like case by case and sometimes it depends on methods. And uh, it's related to voluntary participation but it's, it's, I, I would say it's 95% it's cases applied, it's, it's requirement on informed consent. That means that the, uh, our um, People we work on subjects, objects, they they must give some sign, uh, or we must be sure um, that they uh, give their consent, and it also must be informed. Okay, um, and there is now two two different uh, ways. Um, 
um, most recently, I think mainly because of uh, very active work of different uh, databases and data archives, it's most and the most common or just compulsory to have a written informed consent. And okay, now you can imagine that at the, at the process that we, we would like to store our results of this experiment you saw, and but we, we, we need all written informed consents from all those people. So it, I, I would argue that we, we can do, but it's not at least before our experiment. It's quite impossible and probably it would ru ruin our experiment and method. So it's that argument that doing sometimes, it depends how you can do, but there can be cases that they're uh, applying that. We, we, we will change actually results. And if we, like scientists, who are responsible also of, of, of research quality, we really, that what we produce must be trustworthy. So, so it must um, yeah, contradict our, our, uh, our main uh, action principles. So the other problem might be uh, what I face. I, I, I'm working with European Social Survey uh, that there might be selective sample. Actually, this is what majority of the social scientists see because, uh, of course, nowadays uh, we mostly we never force people to participate. It's always voluntary. The, it even not depending whether we take a paper of consent or not. But what we see that not all people, of course, respond. We know for sure nowadays, because we have analyzed data, that those who are most eager to participate in all kind of scientific uh, uh, experiments, works, surveys, are different people from them who are very, very busy and saying, I don't care, actually, I, I don't have time, and, and uh, or even I don't agree at all uh, to participate. For example, in, in, in case of Estonia, I know that those who don't participate in all kinds of service, they are more negative about everything, about Estonia, about the European Union, about their lives, about the neighbors, etc. So basically, we are agreeing to work with only a, a very optimistic and positive people. We, once again, we, we will, in the end, uh, present biased research data. And this is why in, 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 um, in most qualitative uh, uh, service nowadays, uh, there is a requirement of a minimum response rate. In European social survey I work with, it's 70, at least 70 percentage. And what, what we are usually <coughs> saying, it's 50 percentage, then you can put your research to trash. It's, there, there are some uh, exceptions. So it's too complicated, uh, like usually in science, but um, its response rate is very important. But uh, acquiring informed consent can be sometimes a problem. Um, a child research, we, we know for sure that it's very often required that not only child is agreed, but also parents or all the uh, longer cycle. And then it's what happens when the mother agrees, but the father doesn't, and so etc. These are everyday questions that scientists face. Yes, and all uh, we, we are, I think, I, I really like databases, and I, I absolutely agree that all science data should be stored for, for a long time, and, and more and more research should be, um, uh, be in some databases. But w w what we face nowadays is that uh, w one of those very common requirements says that uh, the informed consent should be about everything what is, go is going to happen to this data. In databases, we, there, there's, it's going to be, hopefully, uh, used for centuries. How could we know for all kinds of purposes it will be used? Can we store data at all then? I think we must find some, some, some solutions here. Okay, so usually the research must be the, in the best interest of respondents and there is also very, very different solutions that uh, we cannot, um, we must all, always think that we, we, we wouldn't hurt or harm in, in whatever way, not um, uh, explicitly, but also um, just um, in terms of publication <coughs> or in direct or indirect information or informants. For example, we are carrying out a survey of criminals. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and during the interview we will know that uh, actually he committed this crime. He was later, uh, the court decision was that uh, no he didn't, but we will get the information he did, or he's going, it's even worse, he's going to, to commit some, some crime. Like researchers, our ethical requirement says that we shouldn't, well, in any way to, to compromise that the safety of interest of our informants. Well, now it depends. But usually I, I agree that that's good, good, uh, good um, principle. But uh, I just show that there is case by case that can be very different uh, solutions. And vulnerable groups. That principle basically says that um, doing research with um, groups of people usually who are less uh, freedom to, s to decide about their lives. For example, children who are not so well informed, students who it's assumed that they are dependent on a, uh, their teachers so they have less choice to what to do or not to do, or uh, um, uh, people in, in medical institutions, hospitals, it's just easy access or prisons. Uh, so they are like vulnerable groups and in case of these we should really uh, be more aware that they, it's voluntary participation and, and they really uh, like, um, yeah, it's basically it's voluntary. Um, what we see already nowadays, and it's also my, my experience my, for, from my life, um, I, I see my colleagues giving up uh, research with these groups, for example children. Why? Because it's, it's so difficult to, to go through all these uh, procedures to prove, prove that uh, you are still ethical scientist and because you have double burden uh, proving that, that it's, it's fair and the, the interests are not contradicted. So there can, might be one solution that, uh, um, yes, uh, that accepting or, or giving somehow uh, high credits for people who still decide for good sake to work with these difficult groups. Otherwise what would happen, and it's already reported in actually uh, research papers, that these, uh, these so-called difficult groups or children, they are not difficult, they are a very important group in society, they will be out of, of research interest. It's, it's, it's also, it, it happens in Estonia, for example. It's up to 18 currently. And what many researchers do, they, they then decide, okay, we, we are you going to take it not 18, it's from 19, <coughs> because if we take 18 or 17 or 15, we will have double workload of organizing our research. And this is just, it's easier to, uh, to get something uh, who are not vulnerable group. Okay, so how it works usually? Um, I, 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 for me, it seems that the scientist is very, very, very important, and this is my one of the ma main arguments is that the, the scientists are actually the key key actors. But of course, the scientists are not the only one. So everything usually starts from or one very important uh, is in financing this institution. What kind of rules they have uh, of, uh, of research, and of course. Uh, they, they, these rules are going to be usually followed. And oh, many scientists, they do some, something or don't do something because of publisher. If you want to paper be published somewhere, it's, uh, and uh, you know for sure it, it, there is a requirement of some ethical committee procedures, so this is uh, what uh, scientists would for sure uh, follow. Uh, of course, there is a board of ethics. Uh, which are very important, the traditions in different countries are very, very different. There are the countries where it's compulsory for everybody. In Estonia, it's compulsory currently, or the culture of ethical boards is uh, compulsory in, in biomedicine, medicine. Uh, but in social sciences and in humanities, it's, it's um, up to the uh, self-feeling. So it's, I think it's very nice. They, they, the boards are open, and uh, I think majority of scientists are aware that they do exist, but then it really depends on you, whether you, you feel it's, uh, it's uh, um, or your interest that you want to publish or requirements or, or a financing institution that you go to that procedure. Uh, in some uh, institutions, universities, uh, there is something like uh, in, um, internal uh, ombuds, ombudsman. 
who, who, will, who is appointed to solve the problems which uh, create during the, the work process. Um, yes, and um, also working abroad, I, I, I see sometimes it's, it's quite a good solution, some, something third, who will, uh, especially in case when there is arguments against <coughs> different colleagues will solve their problems. And of course, there can be public. And also, I think in, in Estonian history, there is some have been some cases. Either a journalist or, or somebody had found and, and started to investigate the, the scientific research procedure. Yes, but if you see that the, the researcher is in the middle of everything, so I'm I'm pretty convinced that everybody has its role here. But the researchers, it's the younger uh, researchers are those who are who we need to 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 teach um, uh, the ethical behavior rules and, and also uh, older one who, who need to uh, discuss and think about the, those things because the life and also research changing all the time. Okay, so some recent challenges. One challenge, uh, especially in social sciences, once again, is that the science it becomes more and more international. So the ethical boards and committees and the rules are currently quite often um, uh, country by country based, and usually ethical boards they follow yes they follow their common sense from one side, but also they follow the, the legal rules in that country, and uh, that's pretty obvious. That uh, I also see my international research experience that these rules are very different in different countries, but like scientists, they are carrying out. International, its project is one, and in, in some cases, once again, like uh, I work with the <coughs> social survey, once again, in order to produce very high quality data and research results, it must be um, very standardized. This is pretty much like physics or chemistry. We, we cannot say that, okay, in one country we, 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 we take uh, th these uh, components and in other country we take the other components, but we still believe that we do the same thing. That's not true. It's not true even in social sciences. But then going through these ethical procedures, we, we, it would be nice to have common rules as well. And uh, the other big issue is, it's not in science only, it, it touches also all the statistical data and all data around us, because the all open data banks and data, open data at all, I think it's, it's the same issue. And usually we are very, very concerned about all those individual data which are somewhere available and, and what is going to happen then. And sometimes I have realized also in Estonia, uh, I have also worked very long time with uh, statistics, uh, statistics of Estonia and uh, other statistical uh, bodies um, and uh, data protection agency that uh, uh, we need to very uh, um, distinguish two groups of data. Uh, and one of them is really personal data. And the personal data, they're not individual data. Individual data are about individuals. But in the end, we don't know who, who these individuals exactly are. And this is what the most, most cases we do collect in uh, social sciences. But at the moment, when we know, we are going to know or keep the uh, ID information about, either it's direct ID, name, um, or it can be something else that we can go back to that person, and we keep and store it, then, then the, 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 all these issues become much much more serious, and then we really must worry that uh, that all, all all the rights and all the long uh, lo uh, what is going to happen to the to the data after 50 years and etc. But in most of cases, actually, we we don't work with with this data, this personal data, when we can go back to the indi individual personally. But we 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 work with some individual data but without ID already and then it's basically it's then it's much easier <coughs> and, and and sometimes that, that's my personal experience that just to make our life easier that first to think which kind of data we have which kind of project we have which yeah what kind of database we have and then it, uh, then uh, then uh, yes to decide what kind of rules we must uh, apply 
So, um, in four years ago, um, we, we um, in, taught our school of behavior social sci and, and medicine and social sciences in Estonia organized um, a special doctoral school um, spring school for PhD students on, on topic of ethics. It was today's I uh, I uh, um, uh, helped to organize it among other scientists and uh, among those two days uh, uh, all the PhD students they, they had lectures but they also had the, the uh, workshops and they, they practiced how to to apply uh, grant or uh, proceed it via ethical board mm, and I think it, everything was very great and the students were very informed but what happened afterwards, uh, I realized that many of those PhD students, they were PhD students, they was, were not like lower uh, undergraduates. They, they came to me and, and, um, and told that, okay, they are going to, up, going to give up their research. Why? Because they thought that they are unethical researchers. I don't think that they were unethical because I, I know all of them and they, they, their research was uh, okay but what they were, they were confused about all those rules and this is what we usually do that they, we, we had a long list of things that you must, uh, requirements that we never should touch people or do anything and, and they're absolutely confused um, uh, and uh, I hope nowadays uh, I know I didn't give up. But what we can learn that, but we can learn that we, we yeah we, we teach. I think it's very very important to teach young young people and and already experienced scientists on that topic. But we, we should somehow combine uh, combine that all the requirements, but also solutions out of that. that how you really. What, what to do and, and where, where is the compromise between uh, seeking the truth of science and still being ethical scientists and, and not compromising all the interests of other counterparts. Yes, and of course it, we must sometimes think about it, it, that procedures should be too, too complicated. Everything what we need, but not too much. And the other very uh, firm thing I'm convinced is that our decisions, ethical decisions must be evidence-based. And um, this is a story I'm going to tell you very shortly, but just before I'm going to tell the story how, how our research knowledge uh, can change our ethical decisions, I just uh, show you one example of the project I'm, I'm working now and what we do. It's a European Social Survey um, and the one principle also nowadays science is very often that uh, that uh, we really sure that uh, the thing we're doing it, it has some benefits. Uh, whenever when our people work they sacrifice their time or something else so it must produce something good. So we have really lots of users and, and uh, data are more than 300,000 individuals, 30 countries, such a variety of, of different uh, cultures, and more than 700 topics. We require informed consent, but not written always. Uh, we must be, we work hard to anonymize data, and it's both, it's not only we take away names, but of course uh, sometimes we can recognize people indirectly. So it's it's hard work to to guarantee that, and uh, it, we must be very uh, aware that everything we do is very cost cost effective. Um, yes, uh, but then it, yes, but then we come to this point that uh, we, we are really this project. Who, who requires that uh, our data and everything, the, the, close, the tiniest um, pieces, even how we teach our, our interviewers, it's very, very standardized. And then, um, and just now we have just uh, acceptance of one ethical committee, but uh, we, we might think that though if all these uh, teams will go through all these uh, ethical committees of 30 countries, what kind of diversity will we get? It sometimes happens in case of some other projects. 
number of projects, it's an uh, ethical committee of international statistics who, whose, whose um, license we, we do have. Um, yes, and we also have requirements that the uh, Norwegian Data Archive is actually our very, very good partner who is in charge of uh, archiving our data. And we have this uh, requirement that, that before they do have a final acceptance, which also includes that also, that all the data is very, uh, mm, they're not sensitive any, any, any more in whatever way. Uh, all those hundreds of scientists or thousands of waiting scientists for data actually cannot use that. That's really it's very, very precise uh, data control before that. Okay, but what is ethical? It depends what we know, actually, uh, what hurts people and what doesn't hurt. And I also have uh, um, uh, one experience um, um, Ten years ago, uh, experience uh, um, uh, about um, more about more complicated survey. The topic was much much more sensitive than European Social Survey usual topics are. Um, it was was initiated by actually Norwegian researchers, uh, Svein Mossig, the NOVA uh, research institution. <coughs> they, they carried out it first in in uh, Norway. But then it was picked up by, by Baltic Sea Child Protection Agency or Cooperation, and it was decided that uh, it's such a good survey or worth of doing that, let's do it in all Baltic uh, Sea countries. And then it was decided that it must be conducted by scientists, because the research, uh, Baltic Sea Child Protection is pretty much the organization of different NGOs working on the rights of children and, and uh, different issues. But in order to guarantee professional approach, it, it was very clear requirement that there must be scientists. But the survey itself, it was, it was rather tough because it's, it, it was about sexual abuse, um, violence, um, rape, uh, prostitution, and these were children. They are, they are not grown-ups people. It was meant to be uh, research among, among children. Yes, and of course we also included lots of different issues about attitudes and etc. Okay, and there were seven countries who finally managed to carry out it. Um, and you see that there are two Scandinavian countries, then it's um, Poland, Estonia, Lithuania, uh, Iceland is Scandinavian as well, and, and Russia was, wasn't tra truly true Russia, but it was St. Petersburg. Okay, so what's the program with that survey? Okay, and before we are going to programs, that, uh, and uh, I'm just saying that uh, despite of programs, there are many, many reasons to, to, to work with such kind of service, because you know, we know for sure that just we look at the normal statistics, it's obviously, uh, we know it already for sure, it's underreported. So actually, like scientists, we need to carry out the uh, service in, in some other types. What's the methods? It's very often up to scientists to decide. Yes. And, but at the same time, there are, there are lots of things to worry about because the, the, the survey itself, it's included really sensitive questions. It's, if it's, and it, uh, most worries were related to those uh, young people uh, who assume that they will they are will uh, be in our service who had experienced in, in their lives really something very, very difficult, for example, rape. And then it came very like precise procedure. When, how exactly, what it happens, uh, how many uh, what, uh, who they were, and etc. So what we, we were very, very worried about. Uh, first, um, actually we had two worries. One was from scientific point of view, because we, 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 we know, uh, once again, we, uh, this is, we actually know, knew before, that <laughs> everything uh, related to sexual behavior of people, it's, it's, uh, there is very high probability to either older or under-reporting. It's not only about children, it's also applies for grown-ups. 
So just now we carry out the, the men's survey in Estonia, which includes also lots of uh, um, information about sexual activities. We, we like scientists, might, must figure out what is the truth behind that, what they report, actually. But in case of children, we first, that, that survey was meant to be the survey about abuse. We wanted to compare those people who had, the, uh, or young children who had this very painful experience with, with those who don't have, and then find out what, what are the risk factors. So we really wanted that the, those who have, they are sure to report it. And the other, the other problem was more like ethical or, or directly ethical. So what's then? Then we really capture these young children. They are young and they, let's say, they had recently this experience. So we know that it's something like uh, recall of pain, painful memories, all kind of mental distress, uh, what could follow. But we like scientists. Uh, had be, be, must be very well prepared for those cases. And, but we, we are not in, in psychiatry or medicine, we are mostly all those people who are uh, from so, social sciences. In all that where they, they also in psychology. Okay, what do we did actually? So I really like this project because uh, uh, the first point is to, to really assess all those risks and if you, if you know or you, you can, you, you can foresee, then you could figure out some solutions. So it's in science, it's, uh, we did really in different countries a little bit differently, but different efforts to, to main um, uh, as um, or, well um, individual or as it could be for, for children to, to answer. So in Estonia we, we created personal space and and only we didn't trust teachers in, in Norway they, they told that teachers are um, okay the uh, children are not afraid of them and, and also teachers were involved of that research they they passed the questionnaires uh, uh, but we gave uh, personal space for all children and um, and uh, and different people who were also explained why it's and, and what to do um, and, and this is what we wanted to guarantee, that they really feel safe and there were special envelopes and, 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 to, and they, they could report this, otherwise it's a waste of money. And from uh, recall of memories, so we um, uh, simultaneously with doing research, actually we've, um, we gave like uh, courses or, or leaf and leaflets to, to all not only those who, who are somehow risky situation to all children uh, with the information where are all the closest uh, um, either NGOs or, or um, cabinets to uh, uh, go or phone numbers to apply if you have something in your life or what to do at all in such a cases. And then we also ensured that, uh, that nobody would or also your classmates or nobody around in surroundings could recognize that you had reported. This is where we need to, need to fake questionnaire because uh, the, those who had experience <coughs> had to report, let's say, two pages what happened, but those who didn't have, we had to figure out some other questions. So they had to equal the questionnaire equal length, length that they are all are like doing the same, same thing, although it wasn't the same thing. Okay, and we immediately recognized that there are country differences. In Poland, it, it wasn't um, uh, first at all agreed. It was in publicly in TV and argued like, like scientists ruining uh, all the youth and, and doing very, very, very wrong thing. In Estonia, we uh, got the financing from Hazard Mango, Maxu Nungogo, and I think it was um, pretty okay. Uh, we also schooled directors and parents were not against, really. It was quite easy. In Norway, Sweden, they went through ethical committee procedures and they didn't have problems. But um, yes, but if you remember, we were very, mainly very much uh, afraid of those who had this viol uh, violence experience, what happened to them. And then Estonia was very first. We, we, we finished data collection. Uh, because different countries had different uh, resources and we were the first who got money and most quicker we carried out field work. 
And then we got the results. We were very surprised because the very, very first results showed something contradictory. Those young people, at first we were very pleased that indeed they reported us uh, about such experiences. But the second thing was that uh, then we, uh, uh, we, have something, uh, we had something like uh, in the very end of block of questions uh, um, uh, where they could reply how the questionnaire was and do they think that it's okay to ask or carry out such a survey at all. And the first surprise was that actually those young people who had experience, they were most positive about that. Why? Because it, sometimes uh, they, they were also, they could write us something. And, 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 and some wrote that they, 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 they do it because they think, uh, 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 or they share the experience because nothing like that would happen to any, anybody else. They also wrote us other stories and sometimes it turned out that what they thought it's prostitution, it's not necessarily the prostitution in, in our sense, like we understand that they, they got some money from on the streets or something like that, uh, yeah, something else. Uh, yes, but the, the main point was, was very encouraging, but uh, we were wrong, like scientists, a little bit. Uh, okay, but then we continued and we, we got research grants, so we used Swedes together to, to carry out research actually about the vulnerability of, of, um, of uh, young people in, in case of such a service. And basically that's the, the final result here. That's first I'm saying that uh, there wasn't cases, very, very severe cases where uh, something really distress would happen that, uh, that the, any negative results but uh, but uh, here is the analysis of the questions in the end of the questionnaire and that's the main dependent uh, uh, um, indicator that's the distress or you were disturbed you didn't like the questions actually and these are uh, here you see that, that he the, there are the people who are, who are sexually abused and um, and then we had the other risk group, it's uh, sexually inexperienced. They, they, they didn't have sex in their life before, basically, simply saying. And uh, the lines here show uh, how, how tensely uh, uh, these indicators are related to this, uh, um, uh, that they felt unease or some dis little distress with this questionnaire. And first, we, what, for our first worry was this group. And we basically see that there is no direct, direct or it's insignificant. It goes, uh, uh, in, indeed, if these peop uh, young people had uh, some mental problems as well, so they were a little bit distressed. But the, the main, the most strong uh, relationship is uh, with two indicators. First of all, those who are sexually inex inexperienced, they didn't have sex, and now they got lots of questions about sex. Uh, and this is, wasn't, uh, once again, it, di it didn't cause any mm, severe problems. They didn't like these questions just. But then third, very interesting group, we, we couldn't expect. These are uh, uh, peop young, young people who actually accept rape myths. And then myths are lot, something like that, that uh, they were argue, argues that if, uh, if, for example, a girl got Get, gets raped that this is her own whole problem or this is because he she behaves uh, in a strange way or it's not that uh, girls uh, can go out of boys and etc and this is where we get got the strongest um, uh, uh, relationship and it tells that those who young people who they were very conservative or they accepted those myths they didn't also like questions okay and let's now go, go to conclusions. Yeah, so there, of course there were some country differences as well, but uh, I'm not going to tell them here. Okay, so what we learned. Uh, our first group that we were very worried about this uh, with, with people, or young people with experience, we were a little bit wrong. I, I, I wouldn't say that there's not reason to worry about, but the, perhaps I, being in ethical committee, I wouldn't argue against that at least because against that survey, at, at least on the basis of that argument that it's, it's um, uh, that's a threat. 
and, uh, and I, I really believe that uh, in order to make ethical decisions, to, we must be more informed actually what influences people, what hurts them and what doesn't hurt. Because sometimes some things we think hurt, don't. Yes, and, um, and of course we see that there, there might be different projects with, with different work probably we need different treatment. There are more <coughs> risky uh, topics uh, uh, um, and hi with higher risks and there are some projects with, with less risk and perhaps we need it. And the most, uh, most thing in the end I would encourage actually research on that topic because you can publish it. So this is how we did. And thank you very much. <laughs>